hopefully you guys uh, will see this as a, as a nice um, talk for setting the stage. Uh, the original idea was to have it as a very in-depth, very long two-panel talk. I think that, that was very uh, optimistic. Um, so this will be hopefully a cool talk in kind of the history and the, uh, the, the, the field of program analysis, how we got where we got and where we came from. Um, let's see, we're almost there. Is it nine? Can we have a countdown? You can get All right. The stage is mine. Psych, I'm not talking about program analysis. We're going to look at cats all day. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, when I saw that it was the 25th anniversary of DEF CON, um, I had this thought because just the week before I read the, the CFP, I was reading some paper about program analysis uh, that was published in the 90s. And I was thinking that, you know, wow, these guys had s like a lot of the same ideas that we're having now. And they were talking about this in the 90s. I wonder how much other uh, such history has kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, and uh, so I started looking a little bit, digging through, and I wrote this uh, uh, proposal for the CFP um, to kind of go through the last 25 years of program analysis. And then when I was putting together the slides, I realized that program analysis goes way farther back. So uh, where does, you know, the 25 years uh, number come from? Um, and I thought about some more, I realized that 25 years is actually my involvement with program analysis. 25 years ago, my grandma gifted me a book called Professor Fortran's Encyclopedia, which had like a cat named X and a professor named Fortran and a caterpillar named Caterpillar. Um, and it, it went through their adventures in computer land and uh, taught kids all about computer. I was, I was crazy about this book. I ditched classes in first grade to hide in the stairwell and reread this book over and over. And I, I uh, learned basic from it. And then later on, um, went, moved on to, to C and so forth. And I realized very early on that if I you know, make a standard program that asks me for my name, and my name is too long, my last name, by the way, is Shoshitashvili. So it, I actually triggered bugs with this last name. Um, then the program would crash. So then, you know, that, that turns out to be a buffer overflow and so forth. And then I started um, realizing that it's incredible to look at a computer program, try to understand how it really works. I mean, that's a whole different world in there, right? A world of ones and zeros and uh, assembly instructions and logic gates. And somewhere along the line, it becomes alive and it becomes behaving and, and starts behaving in ways that you don't quite understand ahead of time. Um, and that's manual program analysis, understanding how this works. But then you can take that and make it automated. You can create programs that can understand programs. And it's like a whole level of uh, craziness. That's like creating some sort of intelligence almost. And, and that's what fascinates me about program analysis. That's what's kept me uh, going down the path I've been going for the last 25 years. And so uh, this talk is about, you know, the history of program analysis, and it's about, you know, why we want to do program analysis in terms of kind of the, the dry things, like we want to, you know, hack programs, we want to make sure programs are safe. But um, try to approach this topic from the sort of kid's perspective of discovering a whole new world of how programs work and how programs might understand other programs. Uh, program analysis is useful, but it's also kind of magical in a way. So with that said, let's move on to technical issues. Hmm. Hold on. Boom. Success. Let's move on to program analysis. Um, program analysis is a uh, field that has basically three parts to it, right? You want to analyze a program, but you always want to analyze a program to um, figure something out about it. So for example, you might want to make sure that a certain specification of the program holds. The program doesn't crash. The program doesn't allow 
uh, random people to unlock your uh, smart key for your house. The program doesn't allow you know, for your brakes to be remotely controlled and so on. Um, and uh, you have a, a goal that you want to achieve with that specification. So for example, if your specification is, hey, I uh, you know, don't want this to crash, you could say I want to make sure that that uh, specification holds always, or you want to say, uh, you might want to say, I want to make sure that that specification does not hold. I want to find the crash, right? So kind of are you looking for bugs? Are you trying to make sure things are safe? And uh, then, of course, once you decide what you want to do, you need to decide how you want to do it. What is the technique that you're going to use to reason about a specification on your program? Um, and with these three kind of categories in mind, I'm going to run you through the history of program analysis and uh, where along the line we collected different uh, items, kind of different instances of, of, of these three categories. Um, and so we're going to commence on a brief history of computing starting in the 1830s with Charles Babbage. Uh, Charles Babbage created the analytical engine, it was a mechanical computer a super far ahead of its time, um, and he wrote a bunch of programs for it. Uh, by all accounts, these programs were actually really buggy, so that's really interesting. Some of the first computer programs written were already buggy. We didn't have that term yet. I'll talk about that later. Um, and about a decade later, Ada Lovelace uh, published a series of notes um, and uh, you know, more reasoning about this analytical engine, including the first program, the first complex program for one of these machines. So this is Ada Lovelace's uh, description of the trace of uh, the uh, execution trace of this program. Right? And the program computed uh, Bernoulli numbers. And so she goes through instruction by instruction and says how uh, variables change and so forth. And this is in the 1840s. Right? Um, and so that's where uh, things started. In uh, 1947, about 105 years later, uh, we got the term bug. Grace Hopper found a, or people working with her, found a uh, actual moth inside a computer causing a computer error. So 100 years roughly after the first instance of kind of a computer in the semi-modern era, we have kind of this official term for the word bug. Um, and this very quickly um, started getting people thinking about how do we kind of prevent actual software bugs. The moth, I guess, technically was kind of a wetware bug. Um, but how do we prevent bugs in our software? And one of the kind of early uh, visionaries here was um, Alan Turing. Um, who's known for, of course, the Turing machine, but also cracking Enigma and, and, and onwards and onwards. Um, but he also had the first paper that I could find that talked about, hey, maybe we should try to make sure that, that the program is correct, right? Um, and he published this in 1949. So two years after the kind of invention of the term bug, people start thinking about how do we uh, make sure that there are no bugs in the uh, in a program, and this uh, creates the field of program verification. So program verification says that hey, given a, a program and its specification, we want to make sure that there are no bugs in this program. That this program uh, carries out the computation it needs to carry out, and so forth, um, and doesn't go astray. Um, so as an example, here's a, a simple program that uh, has a crash, but that crash is not reachable, right? So if you give this program um, the uh, somehow three numbers that add up where A plus B equals C, but then C minus B is not equal to A, it'll crash. And you want to see if this program is safe. You can run a program verification uh, on it, which will identify you know, hopefully that uh, this um, condition can never hold and will produce a proof that tells you that the program is safe according to your specification. Uh, so that's great. And if everything worked like that in the real world, 
uh, then we might not have bugs. And in, in, in certain cases, it does work like this uh, in the real world. So there is formally verified hardware, according to a specific specification, of course. So things that the specification doesn't reason about, you know, maybe still can go wrong with that hardware, but uh, things that uh, are uh, covered by the specification don't. So there's, you know, hardware that can provably uh, not contain uh, kind of timing side channel attacks, for example. Um, and there's verified software. Um, I heard uh, recently that Google, for example, is switching over to a formally verified crypto uh, system. Um, and so the problems, of course, come when, when the software kind of gets bigger and complexity starts getting introduced and uh, verification stops being able to reason about things very effectively. So for example, here um, we have a different type of program, right? And uh, this program also doesn't crash. Uh, that uh, A cubed plus B cubed equals C cubed, that's Fermat's last theorem, right? That is uh, not solvable, there's no solution. Um, but it took humans hundreds of years uh, to figure this out, and uh, the computer you know, verification tools, unless they're special coded for this, will uh, also be unable to handle it. So it will kind of see this um, condition. It'll say, okay, well, if, uh, if this condition is true, then the program will crash. Can I prove that the condition is always false? And if it can't prove that the condition is always false, it has no choice but to uh, alert that the uh, program cannot be verified. So um, what happens then, right? So then uh, you have to go in and you have to start looking at uh, the program manually and, and finding bugs. And if anyone's used kind of commercially available uh, static analysis tools, um, you're very well familiar with the false positive problem, right? You open up a uh, binary or a, a piece of software and the tool pops up alerts all over the place. Um, and some of those are actual bugs, but you spend a lot of time chasing down the alerts. Uh, so when we looked at, you know, software, uh, open source software, for example, um, we often see, you know, a security check done twice, the same check. You know, if A is not null, if A is not null. Why is that check there twice? Because for whatever reason, a uh, program verification tool alerted that there could be a bug there and the programmer figured out some hack to make it shut up. So program verification, while it's a very useful field, like I said, there is verified software and hardware out there, um, it's not kind of the, the, the final answer on its own. So we also at some point need to have kind of the flip side. So program verification can say that is safe, but you know, after that it says, okay, I, I can't really reason about it. So the flip side is you have a technique that says that is not safe. I can prove it, but I can't really prove, you know, if it is safe, but if it is not safe, I'll give you a counter example. Um, and the way this works is uh, by, you know, finding counter examples through whatever technique. Um, so in this case, with a slightly different uh, um, condition, that is uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, a technique might find a, b, and c of three, four, and five as a counterexample that will reproduce a crash. And so this is, uh, there are many techniques that you know, we'll uh, mention later that uh, can be used to do program testing, but one of the very early ones, the first instance of uh, program testing of this style that I found was in the 1950s, which is about four decades before I thought that this um, kind of idea was, was uh, created. Uh, programmers in the 1950s would program in, in punch cards, and uh, to test their code, it was common practice to dig punch cards out of the trash and feed them as input to your program. This is unexpected input, just random stuff, and of course, if I had random stuff, your program shouldn't crash. So this is kind of an early uh, um, example of this sort of uh, kind of institutionalized testing uh, that we're, you know, only seeing come back uh, recently. Um, and so 
you know, there, there's early developments, verification, testing, the, the creation of those two ideas, um, and then um, the idea of what you might check for. So uh, the, um, you know, trash decks check for crashes. Uh, Turing reasoned about uh, ensuring logical properties. Uh, but this was all done manually. So this is kind of our first uh, set of tools in our tool bag, and they're manual tools. We have to dig them out. Okay, let's get our trash... Uh, you know, cards, uh, this one got eaten by something and, you know, put in the ones that won't jam your machine and, and, and uh, try them. Um, but none of this was automated. And so uh, as m computers became more and more ubiquitous, the need for automation started showing itself. Um, so again, we uh, come on um, a mention of Grace Hopper here. Um, because she not only found the first bug, but she also invented the compiler. So Grace Hopper in 1952 published a paper saying, hey, what if we wrote in kind of higher level languages and it got you know, squished down to, to computer code? Um, and uh, this took a little while to catch on. And the reason it took a while to catch on, uh, one of the reasons, is that uh, the uh, code that was generated by this compiler was very slow. It couldn't be, uh, you know, it optimized as well as handwritten assembly could at the time. Um, and so this uh, identified another need, another goal of program analysis, transformation of binaries into something different, something faster in this case. Um, and in the modern era, you know, you can transform binaries, for example, or transform programs to uh, ensure that they're safe. You can transfer programs to meet any sort of specification and run on a different set of hardware. Um, and so uh, now we needed to optimize code because you know people write slow code when they're writing source for whatever reason. Um, and uh, another thing happened. People started realizing that we have all of these uh, architectures with um, all of this data flowing around in them. And if you're not very, very, very careful, some data could be read from or written to a different location than intended, and uh, the memory could be corrupted. So I just played you know, two days of a CTF full of these errors, of course, memory corruption uh, bugs. Um, and uh, this was first described in 1968. In 1968, there was a paper saying, hey, you know, we noticed that uh, if the kernel, they called it a monitor at the time, blindly trusts everything that, uh, you know, the, the user space sends it, bad things can start to happen. Um, and so this paper introduced that concept. It's also the paper that, you know, one of the early works in uh, memory protection uh, and, and virtual memory and so forth, um, which is pretty, Interesting that immediately they realized this was a problem. And um, a little while later, uh, there was, uh, you know, Ken Thompson's reflecting on trusting trust, where he reasoned that you could build in a backdoor into a compiler that could build in backdoors into sensitive code. And so suddenly we have um, two more things that we need to uh, worry about in terms of specifications, um, or even more, but, you know, including memory safety, information disclosure. Uh, and authentication, right? So now you might want to verify that a program doesn't have a backdoor. Um, or you might verify that a program will not leak your sensitive private information. That, is, that one is uh, very uh, relevant today with all of our phones having all of our information and uh, very little control over it. Um, and so the need for automation was pretty well established. Uh, by the kind of turn of the century for sure. Um, but even before that, uh, those papers were like in the 19, you know, 60s or something, late 1960s. And very quickly, oops, sorry. Very quickly, uh, people started to um, meet this need. The, the research community started pumping out automated approaches. And so I'm going to introduce a couple of these automated approaches. Um, and uh, before I do so, I want to make you guys uh, experts in program analysis so that we can uh, reason about what's going on here. So uh, we'll talk about a couple of prerequisites, right? So let's say you have a program. So on the top right, there's like a little Python program already uh, 
that's already a vulnerable program, by the way. Uh, and so you have this program, uh, and you want to analyze it. So you have to reason about a program in a slightly different way as a computer than as a human. So, for example, a program is viewed by a computer as a set of basic blocks. A basic block is a piece of code that is executed uh, altogether before passing on control flow somewhere else. So uh, in our case, we'll pretend that input is part of this basic block. So this x equals input is um, a single basic block, and then it might branch depending on the input, right? So if you put in 42, it'll do one thing. If you put in uh, something else, it'll do another. And so this is the end of the basic block, and then the result of that if statement is two other basic blocks, the true case and the false case. And each of these has um, a uh, constraint that has to be met, right? In order to go down one path, you have to put in 42. In order to go down another, you have to put in not 42. And so these are called constraints. If you then uh, look at all of the basic blocks of a program, this is called the control flow graph. Um, because that's, you know, these are basic blocks and control flows between them. And uh, if you look at a path down this graph, now in this case the graph is nice and simple, but in reality it could have loops, a path might hit the same node multiple times, and so on. Um, and then you look at the constraints all along this path, these are the path predicates that uh, uniquely identified this path. So if you collect all of these constraints and you uh, say that x is not 42 but x is 1337, that input will, uh, any input that matches those constraints will take the same path through the program. Um, so these are kind of the, the prerequisites of our uh, program analysis techniques. So now we'll go through three of them, actually for time reasons we'll go through two of them and mention a third. But we'll start with symbolic execution. And symbolic execution got a lot of hype um, recently, especially with stuff like the Cyber Grand Challenge um, uh, and so on, as a, as a way for uh, machines to reason about program code. Um, and you think that this is something new, but it turns out that it's not. It's uh, quite old, actually. So 40 years ago, uh, a little bit more, the first symbolic execution paper that I could find was proposed. Um, and there were, there were several actually right in one year, basically. So this idea had some prerequisites that were met, and then it exploded. Um, and so the symbolic execution engines were developed that uh, could then symbolically execute Fortran code. Now we have symbolic execution engines uh, that you can download off GitHub that can execute binaries, Java, uh, Android, whatever you want. Um, and uh, this is kind of a, a fairly powerful way of reasoning about programs, and uh, let's run through an introduction of it with a slightly more complicated um, example than you know what we learned about by, uh, program analysis with. Um, hold on. So here's a program that has several bugs, right? Um, one is it, uh, well, it definitely has one bug, and that is if you enter um, a uh, username of service and a command code of seven, it'll crash, right? Um, you can imagine that instead of this crash, it does some system uh, relevant stuff, so it could be a back door instead of memory corruption, but basically we have a program with a bug and we would like to find this bug. So let's see how we might approach this problem with symbolic execution, right? Um, so first let's look at the, base, uh, the control flow graph of this program, starting from the beginning. And the control flow graph is uh, made up of basic blocks and the control flow transitions between them. So we start at this input. Um, if the input is service, it branches, if the username is service, it branches into uh, one side of uh, the equation where it, of the program, where it uh, checks for the command code being seven. And if it is, it crashes. If not, it prints unknown command um, and then uh, exits. On the other side of the branch, it uh, checks, asks for a passcode. If the passcode is invalid, it prints invalid passcode. Otherwise, it calls the authentication function. Then it prints exit and exit. So this is our 
uh, control flow graph, and how would we uh, use symbolic execution to try to find that crash, to try to find uh, the ability to reach this crash. So uh, we would start executing the program in an emulator, and in this emulator, instead of ones and zeros, we are working on uh, X, Y, and other symbols, right? So, for example, username uh, is a symbol in this uh, emulator, so when we pull in an input, it'll produce an unconstrained variable called username. And we don't know what username is. Username can be anything uh, because, you know, that is our, uh, how we implement our emulator. Um, and as we check for values of username, we create what are called constraints, right? So these are the, the exact constraints of the, that the basic block checks uh, when it pushes execution forward. Um, and we collect two constraints in this case. On the one side, username equals service. On the other side, it does not equal service. These are constraints, and we continue um, executing both sides of this statement with symbolic execution. Uh, but then we hit something that is very bad for symbolic execution. We hit, uh, for example, string processing functions. So a string processing function like A2I might check a given byte, see if it is a number. If it is a number, it'll do one thing. If it's not, it'll do another, right? Or if it's a certain number, it might do one. If it's a, not a certain number, it'll do another. So it'll keep branching the symbolic emulator at every, uh, I'm sorry? Oh, awesome. It'll keep branching the symbolic emulator at uh, every if statement, at every check on this number until we get into a situation where there are just too many checks, right? So it'll try to check for a command code of, you know, uh, 10 bytes with uh, arbitrary values of nine bytes and so on. And there's an exponential path explosion here. Uh, and there are some approaches in the symbolic uh, execution world to try to deal with this sort of path explosion. But in general, these approaches boil down to the requirement to remove paths, right, and lose this information. And so in the end, the symbolic execution engine might um, only find certain paths and not others and miss the bug because we have to simplify to keep things tractable. So that's symbolic execution. It might find the bug if you're lucky, right? But if you're not, and it has to simplify uh, its state space essentially uh, as it's executing, there are certain things that it might miss. Um, symbolic execution was proposed as uh, you saw in 1975. Uh, but the interesting thing is that in uh, Ada Lovelace's notes from uh, 1942, we can see that she did a symbolic trace of the execution of her program. So in where she has this sort of program execution uh, log in her notes, she writes down the symbol, the, the equation for each uh, uh, variable as uh, the program progresses. And this is the first symbolic trace of a program done in 1842 before computers were invented. So that was a pretty interesting thing to find um, and kind of a, a, a nice point of history that we can put as the start of program analysis in this sense, 19, uh, 1842, not you know 1975 or 1949 or uh, any of those much, much later dates. And so symbolic execution uh, is a kind of tool in our tool set uh, that uh, we can use to achieve uh, either verification of a specification, the testing of a specification, um, or to support the transformation of code. Uh, of course, how you verify a program, for example, using symbolic execution, uh, is a pretty complex uh, thing with the symbolic execution uh, style that I described this for program testing. It generates inputs to find vulnerabilities, but it can't prove that there aren't any. Um, but uh, that's kind of a, we could go down that route for an entire semester course and not just a 45-minute uh, introductory talk. So I'll leave that as future research for you guys. And we'll go on to static analysis because static analysis can 
um, show that, for example, a program is um, immune to a certain class of vulnerabilities or uh, so, uh, properly implements a certain specification. Um, static analysis, uh, or at least one of the very uh, common ways to do static analysis, which is abstract interpretation, uh, was proposed in uh, 1977, shortly after symbolic execution. And uh, abstract interpretation looks at the, uh, oops, that should say abstract interpretation, um, looks at the uh, control flow graph, uh, the, the, the program as a whole, essentially. It uh, doesn't have to figure out how to reach a certain uh, basic block to reason about properties of the program at that basic block, uh, which is the problem that symbolic execution had and, and uh, the reason that symbolic execution could not find uh, the bug in our example. And so uh, static analysis with abstract interpretation might be able to find that bug, probably will be able to find that bug if it is a simple bug for example, or actually I should say will be able to find that bug um, because if it cannot prove that a piece of code is safe, it will uh, raise an alert. The problem is that, as we talked about, there are false positives. So in our program, it might think that that function has a bug, even if the, uh, it doesn't alert on that and eat up time uh, for a human to go through and verify all of these results. Um, and so through abstract interpretation, we got a way to uh, perform verification of a specification on a program um, in 1977, 40 years ago. Um, and then we moved on to uh, fuzzing. And so fuzzing is kind of one of the, the uh, biggest ways to find vulnerabilities in modern software. And it's actually surprisingly simple. Um, proposed in 1981 initially in its most basic form, which was, uh, hey, let's um, throw random input at a program and see if it crashes. It's evolved quite a bit since then. And so the uh, specific um, implementation of fuzzing that I'll describe here is implemented by American Fuzzy Lop. Um, it's a fuzzer that mutates its inputs when it detects differences in program execution. And so let's see how it would run on our program here. Um, we would start with uh, some randomly generated test case or a human seated test case. So a human might input a uh, username of ASDF and a password of 111. And uh, that um, input will trigger certain basic blocks to be executed, right? And so we executed the username input, of course. We executed the check for the um, kind of service uh, username uh, that could lead to the crash. We did not satisfy it, so we took the else branch, uh, read in the passcode, and uh, aired out on an invalid uh, passcode um, and exited. So we triggered those basic blocks. And so the fuzzer starts mutating this input, right? It might make a lowercase d, a capital D or something, or it might, um, or it might uh, mutate input in a way that uh, passes another check. So it mutated the input in a way that uh, passes that uh, passcode check. It actually doesn't because there's another bug in the program that I didn't notice before. But uh, let's pretend that it, uh, uh, it, it creates a valid you know, size of a passcode and uh, triggers that authenticated authentication function, right? So that is a new basic block that it triggers. Now, we, with fuzzing, we've uh, triggered a block that, you know, symbolic execution before us wasn't able to trigger uh, just through randomly mutating um, inputs. But then we get stuck because through randomly mutating inputs, we are unable to satisfy complex checks, right? We need a username of service and we have randomly mutated usernames. The chances are that we'll create the string service are very slim and we'll keep guessing and guessing and guessing. Of course, in this specific case, you could seed the fuzzer with the string service and you could scan the binary for, or the program for all of its strings and uh, automatically, you know, make the fuzzer pass this check. But, you know, string checks aren't the only complex checks in programs. There are hashes, 
there are uh, complex uh, input formats, um, dependencies between different input bytes. And so in the general case, we uh, cannot guarantee, of course, with a fuzzer that we will find uh, code that is protected by these complex checks. Um, and so, you know, fuzzing with this uh, random data, of course, is a throwback to this uh, trash deck concept. So, you know, fuzzing was invented in 1950, not 1981, um, or at least manual fuzzing. Uh, so again, we find that, you know, program analysis techniques harken back to the middle of the century, uh, even and sometimes even farther to uh, the 1800s. Um, so now we have this kind of toolbox of a bunch of specifications that we can enforce uh, a, uh, uh, some goals that our analysis could uh, try to achieve and the technique through which we uh, can achieve them. And um, next, we should evaluate them, understand how these uh, different, uh, understand how these different goals um, or how these different techniques help us uh, achieve program analysis goals. And um, as a scientist, you know, uh, if you uh, uh, start thinking up an approach and you have a cool idea and you uh, have a, a new program analysis technique, you want to evaluate it. So you want to take uh, programs and specifications, feed them into your technique, and see how well it does. This is my clip art uh, slide, by the way. So hopefully my clip art game is on point. Um, so you, you run your analysis, you get your results, and you're happy, right? Well, there are a number of problems with this. One is that the analysis is more complex than you might think, because any program analysis has to deal with the environment of the program it's analyzing. And environments like Windows, Mac OS, Linux, uh, mobile devices, uh, cyber physical devices, they have really complex environments. And having to model this environment even before analyzing, uh, understanding how much better your program analysis technique is than uh, previous techniques is quite a big investment that uh, people often don't make or uh, make in a kind of uh, very fast uh, matter. Another problem is uh, finding a good data set to evaluate on, right? Uh, there's not really a good data set for, or there wasn't a great data set for vulnerability research. This problem is actually being worked on and new data sets are being created as I'll uh, talk about, but you need a good data set with uh, uh, ideally known vulnerabilities, so you can reason about how many of them your bug finds, uh, and, and with uh, variable vulnerabilities in, in different programs, so your, uh, your technique isn't um, you know, just specifically tailored for uh, one style of vulnerability that you happen to detect, uh, or one specific program that you happen to be very good at analyzing. Um, another problem is these specifications, right? Specifications in the real world are very complex, uh, whereas specifications um, that you might want to use for your uh, analysis tool uh, initially in the early stages of development need to be fairly simple and ideally pre-provided. I mean, if you're looking at the uh, analyzing something like Chrome and your specification is that Chrome should not leak uh, user data to someone that should not get this user data, that's impossibly broad and impossible to enforce. Is your bank allowed to have your you know, various cookies or, or something along these lines? Um, so you need a very good data set, standard data set with a very good uh, standard implementation, um, a standard set of specifications so that you can analyze how well your technique runs compared to uh, uh, different work and compare those results to prior work because that's a very important part of science and technical development is understanding if you're making an improvement or not. Um, and so we had problems as a analysis community in me meeting all of these goals and having a good data set of applications with a good set of specifications, 
on a good um, environment that wasn't too complex to uh, implement and that could produce results that we could reason about, that we could say, okay, you know, we have ground truth data for the vulnerabilities that are actually in this data set um, and we detect X of them or we uh, manage to rule out vulnerabilities in code that has no vulnerabilities and, uh, you know, so our program verification is correct. Um, and, and so there, like I mentioned, there have been several uh, projects to um, solve this problem, to create these data sets, and one of these uh, projects essentially was the Cyber Grant Challenge. If you guys were here last year, you probably saw all of the uh, Cyber Grant Challenge, um, you know, hoopla, uh, where for the first time in history, seven fully automated program analysis machines uh, fought each other in a game of capture the flag. So the same game that I spent the entire weekend uh, playing and only got four hours of sleep is the game that machines who didn't need to sleep played yesterday, uh, last year rather. And um, these uh, machines, of course, suffered from all of the problems that I just talked about, the environment problem, the specification problem. And so the Cyber Grand Challenge created a custom operating system with very specific vulnerability specifications to uh, evaluate these systems. Now, for the actual competition, of course, the source code wasn't available. Since then, uh, they uh, released the source code. So you can really look at the source code, understand the vulnerability, and then reason about how well your tool finds certain vulnerabilities across 249 binaries. So it's a, it's a, a 249 program. So it's a data set that has a, a lot of uh, variants. There are a lot of uh, different types um, and uh, different difficulties of vulnerabilities. And um, all of this is freely available for uh, people to analyze their tool and understand how well it does. That's my other piece of clip art. Um, so the Cyber Grand Challenge and the, the programs that, that were written for this, these 249 programs making up the, the Cyber Grand Challenge data set, um, allowed us to uh, do what I call, uh, to perform what I call the program analysis nursery experiments. So I see the Cyber Grand Challenge data set as the nursery of program analysis where you can reason about different improvements for different techniques. So for example, symbolic execution on the entire data set finds nine vulnerabilities. This symbolic execution as implemented in Anger, which I'll talk about in a sec, uh, which is an open source uh, binary analysis program available on GitHub. Um, but symbolic execution on this entire data set finds nine vulnerabilities. That's not a lot, right? There are vulnerabilities in every program of these 249 programs. It only finds vulnerabilities in nine of them. Um, of course, we can optimize symbolic execution using various tricks. So Anger supports, for example, concrete execution when there is uh, no uncertainty in the state, when, when all the data is known, uh, or when there are constraints on all the data. And so by utilizing all of these optimizations, uh, we can get 26 uh, crashes, crashing 26 binaries. Uh, utilizing static analysis, so uh, combining symbolic execution with very testing, which is a technique created by Carnegie Mellon University uh, that utilizes parts of abstract interpretation to help with symbolic execution, uh, we can push that up to 31. So I should say here that this is our implementation of very testing, and it might be uh, suboptimal. So their very testing might be considerably better. Um, but that all pales in comparison with fuzzing, this seemingly simple technique of throwing random data and seeing what happens uh, finds 106 crashing binaries in the data set. Um, so this gives us an idea of where program analysis is, and, and this is a good showcase for the simplicity of, of evaluating uh, all of these different analyses on this data set and reasoning about the results, because now we can look at them in terms of, uh, you know, summation numbers, but there's also some subtleties there. They find bugs 
different types of bugs in different binaries. So uh, we can look into that and make inferences and try to create new um, approaches. So for example, we looked at the difference in the types of bugs that symbolic execution found and that fuzzing found. And we um, realized that they have very different coverage. So the types of the basic blocks that fuzzing can trigger are very different from the basic blocks that symbolic execution can trigger. And sometimes one finds a crash, sometimes another finds a crash, sometimes neither of them find a crash, in fact, very frequently. And so we um, decided to combine them in a very uh, straightforward but careful way. Um, and the idea is as follows. We begin by fuzzing the binary. This is nice and fast and achieves decent code coverage, but as we discussed, eventually gets stuck on complex checks. And then we use symbolic execution to find the constraint that can get through that check, but possibly suffer from other limitations of symbolic execution and not find the actual bug. And then we synchronize that back into the fuzzer. We synchronize the knowledge of how to bypass the complex check back into the fuzzer, and it continues to mutate that input until it finds the bug. Um, and we do this iteratively, um, back and forth between the fuzzer and symbolic execution. So by implementing symbolic assistance for the fuzzer in this way, uh, we achieve on this entire data set 118 crashes. Um, and an interesting thing is here, here is that we have this 118 crashes in the data set, but um, if you take the union of all of the different techniques, all the different techniques have crashed something like this from memory, 150 to 160 uh, binaries. So there's a lot of uh, uniqueness between the different techniques used here. Um, driller, uh, the applicability of it varies by program, whether or not there are complex checks. Um, we'll, we can run through a quick run here. So this is a control flow graph of an example program, and driller starts in the top left corner there. And uh, it first starts by fuzzing uh, a portion of the program before it gets stuck in a complex check. Um, and this is the basic block coverage on the right in this graph here. Um, you can see just kind of flat lines, right? So then if we run the symbolic execution engine to uh, help the fuzzer reach extra code paths, uh, it allows us to find just a little tiny uh, bit more basic blocks in the, con execute uh, some more basic blocks in that uh, control flow graph of the program. And if we keep uh, invoking the symbolic execution engine to help the fuzzer get unstuck every time that the, the coverage flatlines like that, we eventually drill into the program deep enough to find the bug. And so that's how Driller works. Um, there's still a lot to do. So there's this whole red um, area that uh, however many programs, about 100 programs that we have never exploited before, um, that we have never crashed before using any automated techniques, uh, which represent um, missing uh, tools, basically, that humanity has yet to develop, or at least we have yet to develop. Um, and so if this all sounds interesting to you, I encourage you to join in. There are several ways that you can participate in program analysis research. One is you can contribute to open source frameworks. So uh, we run one of these frameworks um, in our research lab. It's called Anger. Go to anger.io. There's a lot that uh, we could use help with documentation, environment support, uh, better techniques, um, and so on. Um, and the other is that I'm always looking for students. I'm starting as a uh, professor at Arizona State University. Um, I just uh, finished a PhD at uh, UC Santa Barbara, and both of those places are incredible places to go to if you want to do research in program analysis or in general security. So if you're thinking about graduate school or uh, you are um, curious and want to do an internship, uh, reach out to me. I'll put you in touch with the right people, um, and uh, you can explore that. Uh, the presentation is available online. All my contact info is right here, and I guess we'll do questions in the hall. Awesome. Thank you, guys.